Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna do a, a quick little book haul. Um, I've gotten some books recently and I haven't talked about them. So let's let's do that. <laughs> First, I'm actually gonna talk about uh, the Book of the Month Club books I got because I asked on Twitter, what is everybody else getting? <laughs> because I really could not make up my mind. I skipped the first month, the first month, I skipped March. So April finally got to pick, no, I've, I've skipped April and got to pick in March. So uh, the first book I chose was hi, The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas. And a lot of people actually ended up picking this one uh, from the comments that I received on Twitter. It looked like a really great book. Um, it, it was the first one that actually stood out to me based on the cover. So I'm just gonna do like a quick read. Some of these I got a while ago and I hadn't mentioned them. So you know how I do sometimes. I'm not really good at always talking about so I'm just gonna read the, read the answer for you. During the overthrow of the Mexican government, Beatriz's father was executed and her home destroyed. When handsome Don Rodolfo Solorzano proposes, Beatrix ignores the rumors surrounding his first wife's sudden demise, choosing instead to seize the security that his estate in the countryside prov provides. She will have her own home again, no matter the cost, but Hacienda San Is Isidro is not the sanctuary she imagined. When Rodolfo returns to work in the capital, visions and voices invade her sleep. The weight of invisible eyes follows her every move. Rodolfo's sister, Juana, scoffs at Beatrice's fears, but why does she refuse to enter the house at night? Why does the cook burn copal incense at the edge of the kitchen and mark the doorway with strange symbols? What really happened to his first to the first Doña Solorzano. Beatrix only knows two things for certain. Something is wrong with the hacienda and no one there will save her. Desperate for help, she clings to the young priest Padre Andreas as an ally. No ordinary priest, Andreas will have to rely on his skills as a witch to battle the malevolent presence haunting the hacienda. Far from a refuge, San Isidro may be Beatrice's doom. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, this was a cover buy. Uh, I did a brief like reading of the synopsis. When I saw that it was thriller, I was like, I think I'm probably going to end up enjoying this because most of, well, let me not speak too soon. I was going to say most of the thrillers I've received from book of the month I've liked. But when you actually read how many books I've gotten from book of the month and how few I've read. <laughs> I probably might be speaking too soon because I have a lot of thrillers that I received that I chose that I haven't read yet. But the ones that I have read, I've liked. The only one I, it felt kind of flat for me was The the Maidens. I didn't really like that one, but that's okay. So The Hacienda was the first book I got from Book of the Month. The next choice was my add-on and I got Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. I've, now this is a pretty short book. I've heard a lot of people talk about this, especially on book talk. And of course, when you see the book of the month club, like ad on TikTok, this is one of the books that's in the ad. Uh, so I was really interested in it. Everybody says it's really good, but it's also heartbreaking. Uh, so I'll read the insert for those who don't know, like my mom or my sister <laughs> probably haven't heard of this book. When Michelle Zahner was in her mid-twenties working as a waitress and struggling to launch her music career in Philadelphia, she got a call that her mother was ill. She put her life on hold and flew home to Eugene, Oregon to be with her mother through the final excruciating months of her battle with cancer. This is Zahner's searingly candid coming-of-age story of growing apart from of growing apart from and then back together with her Korean identity and of forging her own path in the wake of a devastating loss. With humor and heart, she tells of growing up Asian American, straining to meet her mother's expectations, moving across the country, returning home to reckon with grief. She recalls treasured childhood holidays spent in her grandmother's tiny apartment in Seoul and now in adulthood, learning to cook the Korean dishes that revive the nur and nourish those memories. She savors the unexpected solace of weekly trips to her favorite Asian grocery store. Vivacious and plain spoken, lyrical and honest, Zahner's voice is as radiantly alive on the page as it is on stage, crying in H Mart is an exquisite debut, a book to cherish, share, and reread. So it's a memoir. I really do like memoirs. So I am 
pretty confident that I'm going to like this, but it would also be very sad. Um, I lost my grandmother to cancer last year. Uh, there's been quite a few people in my life, friends or family that have had cancer. I had skin cancer, so this might be something that is going to break me because I've seen a lot of people talk about how it really, neg it n not negatively affected them. It just like, it was a very sad story. So I'm prepared to cry, but it's not that long. So I think that this could be something that I could read pretty quickly, um, but will probably hurt me emotionally. So excited, but nervous to read this book. <laughs> yeah. And the last book I got was The Cartographers by Ping Shepard. Um, I think this was the book from the previous month that I chose to skip. I just couldn't decide on what I wanted. Uh, and I thought more about it this month and was like, you know, I, this one really appealed to me. But the thing that made me not get it at first was the description of 400 plus pages. <laughs> I haven't read like a big over 400 page book in a while and that's what made me kind of stop and not make this the book of the month for that month but again it's just like I just was really interested in it so I had to get it so let's read the inside Nell Young's whole life and greatest passion is cartography her father Dr. Daniel Young is a legend in the field and Nell's personal hero but she hasn't seen or spoken to him ever since he cruelly fired her and destroyed her reputation after an argument over an old cheap gas station highway map but when Dr. Young is found dead in his office at the New York Public Library with the very same seemingly worthless map hidden in his desk, Nell can't resist investigating. To her surprise, she soon discovers that the map is incredibly valuable and exceedingly rare. In fact, she may now have the only copy left in existence because a mysterious collector has been hunting down and destroying every last one, along with anyone who gets in the way. But why? To answer this question, Nell embarks on a dangerous journey to reveal a dark family secret and discovers the true power that lies in maps. Perfect for fans of Joe Hill and B.E. Schwab, The Cartographers is an ode to an art and silent science, history and magic, a spectacularly imaginative modern story about an ancient craft and places still undiscovered. So this is another mystery book. I think it's going to be enjoyable, but you know, I'm probably gonna take my time because of how long it is. So I don't know if this is considered like it's mystery, but also like literary fiction or something. I never know. I never know with literary fiction, like what exactly that is. That's what I mean. So these were the three books I got from book of the month. Uh, they will be joining all of the other books from book of the month that I have not read yet. And slowly I'm chipping away at. <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, next, I just got this book today. It came in the mail because my husband bought it for me. It is Other People's Clothes by Kala Henkel. Uh, someone mentioned this on TikTok. I think it was just in uh, books I recently read that I gave five stars type of TikTok. So of course, like always, I never remember whose TikTok I saw this on. But as soon as I saw it, and they kind of did a little synopsis or like reading with like little word like a one word thing of why this is good. Um, I put it on my wish list. So two young art students arrive from New York, desperately hoping to reinvent themselves. Renting an apartment from an eccentric crime writer, Zoe and Haley spend their nights twisting through Berlin's club scene and their days hungover. Then inexplicable things start happening to the apartment. Are they being spied on? Suspecting their landlady of using their lives for her next novel, they decide to beat her at her own game, hosting wild parties and that quickly gain notoriety. But as events spiral out of control, they begin to wonder whose story they are living and how it will end. Uh, some of the blurbs are fueled by a creeping sense of unease. This is a wild, energetic gem of a novel, sharply observed and very funny, utterly addictive. I couldn't stop turning the pages. Story is multi-layered, touching on sex, female friendship, queerness, Berlin nightlife, drugs, celebrity culture, art in ways that in less confident hands could easily have become a mess. Instead, there's an exuberance to this novel that makes it highly lovable. So it seems like something that's really going to keep me, like the like whoever did that blurb, turning the pages. And I don't know, I just like the cover. It sounded really interesting. It's going to be a mystery thriller. I'm in intrigued. So another one that, I mean, it's paperback, so it's easy to feel like this is short. So it's basically 300 pages, just a little bit over. 
but the text isn't too small. So maybe something I can get through really quickly. So this is what I recently got for my husband. Um, we'll skip around now because I have some nonfiction books that I got, I think right when I got back from Seattle, uh, but I also got some manga. So we can cover that first. So this was very random. Um, I got Zom 100. Uh, it, it was recommended on Amazon. I haven't heard of it and I haven't seen anybody talk about it. Uh, but hey, I had a gift card from work. I thought eh, it would technically be a free book. So let me just do it. So Zom 100 Bucket List of the Dead. After spending years toiling away on a, for a soul-crushing company, Akira's life has lost its luster. But when a zombie apocalypse ravages his town, it gives him the push he needs to live for himself. Now, Akira is on the mission to complete all 100 items on his bucket list before he, well, kicks the bucket. In a trash-filled apartment, 24-year-old Akira T Tendo watches a zombie movie with lifeless, envious eyes. After spending three hard years at an exploitative corporation in Japan, his spirit is broken. He can't even muster the courage to confess his feelings to his beautiful co-worker, Otori. Then one morning, he stumbles upon his landlord eating lunch, which happens to be another tenant. The whole city swarming with zombies, and even though he's running from impending doom, Akira has never felt more alive. I think the first three volumes are available to purchase, but I don't know how long the series is going to be. Just skimming through the artwork it definitely looks like it's going to be like a mixture of some humor but also it's a zombie apocalypse so there's some blood there's some despair there's some fighting so yeah this was a book that I recently got just because it was suggested to me more on the manga tbr like I needed that next I don't know if I mentioned that I got these first three but my husband just bought me the last two. So it's gonna be one piece. What I have been reading before I got these single volumes has been the omnibuses. And my plan at first when I started reading one piece was to basically just get omnibuses because it can be hard to get the um, big box set of single volumes, right? So I thought, oh, I'll just get the omnibuses, I'll be good. But then the omnibuses were sold out when it got to volumes 19, 20, and 21. So I got, this would have been the omnibus that I was missing. And then my husband got me 22 and 23. Uh, the next box set would be volumes 24 through whatever. Now, when I was at Second and Charles, I saw box set three. I am wondering if maybe I'll get lucky and can get box set two at some point. It's not really something that's available, but if not, it's fine. I'll try to see if I, mean, I can start collecting omnibuses again. Who knows? But anyway, I got these five volumes, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Um, I wanted to pick these up when I got them, like right before, either right before or right after Seattle. But when I started reading... 19 I realized ooh, I might need to read the last few pages of the last volume because I couldn't quite remember where we were um we're obviously oh man see I don't even remember where so it's Baroque Works and I remember that storyline but the one I remember is when they're still with Baroque Works um before they make it off get a new thing which I can't remember the name of it that helps them travel like the little compass map to travel from island to island. I think they make it to the princess's island, but I don't remember anything after that. I, I will, oh wait, no I do. They don't realize that the guy who's been undermining the kingdom is Crocodile? Was that his name? Yeah, let, let me go ahead and reread the other one, you know what I'm saying? Because I do not remember. But that's okay. Because I'm excited. I'm still really liking One Piece. I do not regret getting into it. My husband is absolutely obsessed with One Piece. I don't even know what episode he's on anymore. Ay, ay, ay. But I'm trying to catch up. I'm trying to catch up. And last are going to be the nonfiction books. Now y'all know I love a good nonfiction. The TBR is growing constantly, but that's okay because I think it's worth, I think it's worth having nonfiction books that are on these topics. They appeal to me. 
but it also helps me learn. So I would recommend. So pretty much all these that I got uh, were recommended on another TikToker, but this time I'm going to, I, I know who recommended some of these. And it was two different people. So I'm going to, cause I follow them. I'm going to make sure to find their names and I'm gonna put that somewhere on the screen or in the description box. So just in case you wanna follow someone whose content is primarily nonfiction, I highly recommend. So the first book is Radical Suburbs, Experimental Living on the Fringes of, Amer of the American City by Amanda Colson Hurley. And a tiny book, so small. I mean, is it not even 200 pages? America's suburbs are not the homogenous places we sometimes take them for. Today's suburbs are racially, ethnically, and economically diverse, with as many Democratic as Republican voters, a growing population of renters, and rising poverty. The cliche of white picket fences is well past its expiration date. The history of suburb suburbia is equally surprising. American suburbs were once fertile ground for utopian planning, communal living, socially conscious design and integrated housing. We have forgotten that we built suburbs like these, such as co-housing commune near Pittsburgh, a tiny house anarchist community in New Jersey, a government planned garden city in the DC suburbs and a racially integrated subdivision outside Philadelphia. Rac radical suburbs is a history that will help us remake the future and rethink our assumptions of suburbia. So yeah, this stood out to me. I wish I could remember what the, like it was a specific, book it's like if you've read this read this or you might like this so got this because I don't know much about housing American housing I read a little bit one time about redlining but I'm definitely not well versed in when it comes to that stuff so I definitely wanted to pick this up so I could be a little bit more informed if you've read this please let me know what you thought in the comments <laughs> next up I got abolition feminism now Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Erica Mirna, Mirners, and Beth E. Ritchie. Uh, pretty sure that this was not mentioned in the one book haul from a few months ago where my husband got me books. I'm pretty sure I got this after the fact. So forgive me if I've mentioned it already. Um, and if I didn't act like I didn't even say that. <laughs> As a politic and a practice, abolition increasingly shapes our political moment, halting the construction of new jails and propelling movements to divest from policing. Yet, as erased from this landscape are not only the central histories of feminist, usually queer, anti-capitalist grassroots and women of color-led organizing that continue to cultivate abolition, but also a recognition of the stark reality. Abolition is our best response to endemic forms of state and interpersonal gender and sexual violence. Amplifying the analysis and the theories of change generated from vibrant community-based organizing, Abolition Feminism Now traces necessary historical genealogies, key internationalist learnings, and everyday practices to grow our collective and flourishing present and futures. So yes, I want to be more um, informed on abolition. Uh, I all want to be more informed on defunding like the police and stuff like that. Uh, I absolutely agree, especially in America, the way that the prison industrial complex is, is frightening. The justice system is not fair. Uh, and I would like to know more and get more information on that particular subject. So I'm interested in this one. Again, if you've read this, please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. I'd love to know. Or if you're interested in reading it, like a body read. Who knows? I'm starting to annotate now, y'all. So a little bit of book ASMR. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Next, I was actually going to get this book as an add-on for Book of the Month Club for the month that I skipped, but because it wasn't one that was a Book of the Month pick, I couldn't make it just that. So it's fine. I ended up getting this as a paperback anyway, and it is Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino, Reflections on Self-Delusion. Looks like this. So this was an add-on for Book of the Month. So hey, if you are still trying to choose, maybe pick this one up. It sounded interesting to me. Um, Gia Tolentino is a peerless voice of her generation, tackling the conflicts, contradictions, and sea changes that define us in our time in this dazzling New York Times bestselling collection of nine original essays. Written with a rare combination of generosity and sharpness, wit and fearlessness, she delves into the forces that warp our vision, demonstrating an unparalleled stylistic potency and critical dexterity. 
Trick Mirror is an enlightening, unforgettable trip through the river of self-delusion that surges just beneath the surface of our lives. In each essay, Tolentino writes about a cultural prism, the rise of the nightmare social internet, the advent of scamming as a definitive millennial F ethos, the literary heroine's journey from brave to blank to bitter, the punitive dream of optimization, which insists that everything, including our bodies, should become more efficient and beautiful until we die, gleaming with Tolentino's sense of humor and capacity to elucidate and the impossibly complex in an instant, and marked by her desire to treat the reader with profound honesty, Trick Mirror is an instant classic of the worst decade yet. Um, I think I'm pretty sure that this is recommended in a TikTok as well. But I mean, at this point, almost every damn nonfiction book I get is recommended on TikTok. Um, and hey, it's the winner of the Whiting Award. I don't know what that is, but it won. Have you read this? Let me know. These next two I was really, really excited about getting and I couldn't decide if I wanted them as an ebook or if I wanted them physical. But we all know I prefer a physical book if I can. Hashtag Church 2. How Purity Culture Upholds Abuse and How to Find Healing by Emily Joy Allison. Um, an examination of purity culture from the creator of the hashtag church to movement sexual abuse is utterly rampant in christian churches in america and the reasons are somewhat different than those you might find in the me too stories coming out of hollywood or washington church two turns over the rocks of the church's sexual dysfunction revealing just what makes sexualized violence in religious contexts both ubiquitous and uniquely traumatizing and lays the groundwork for survivors of abuse to live full free healthy lives so yeah as soon as someone mentioned this in a uh TikTok I was like wow that that's definitely up my alley as someone who is agnostic atheist you know, somewhere in between there um who is critical of churches and organized religion but we're not gonna get into that okay we're not gonna get into that that's just my personal opinion I'm a little critical uh, I think for good reason and this is coming from someone who's baptized as a catholic my mom's side of the family is catholic uh, my dad's side of the family I mean, they hold, um, I actually don't know if my dad's side of the family is just Christian or if it's like Baptist Christian, because that, I do not know the difference between all of them. I don't know the difference between all those, like, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, and my, my dad's uncle, so my great uncle, um, his wife, my great aunt, uh, they all do a service on Sunday on Facebook Live, which I think is really great. But, you know, I'm someone who is critical of organized religion. I'm not a fan. Um, and I think something like this is really important to read, whether you are like me or you are someone who is religious. I have friends that are Christian. I've had friends that are Mormon. I went to Mormon church with my friend once, well, not just once, but a few times when we were teenagers. So, you know, am I practicing anything? No, but I've been exposed to a lot of different religions. Uh, and I'm pretty critical of it. That's just me. So this was definitely something that I was interested in, especially because like I went and rewatched like Leah Remini's Scientology thing. I was just following someone on TikTok who was doing a series about those um, like, hey, we're going to send you to a boot camp for kids because you're not acting right. But it's all about scripture and church. And obviously, None of those things, none of those facilities are actually there to help children. It's for trafficking. It's for abuse. It's for labor. I mean, these kids are starved. They're abused. It's pretty brutal. I just watched that recently and that was really sad to watch. Um, but yeah, so I'm excited about reading this. And I am pretty sure this is the last book. I just tried to do like a little look around and I don't think I got anything else new besides like a book in a series which is why we don't need to mention it because I'm reading it anyway so I got The Making of Biblical Womanhood by Beth Allison Barr How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth um mentioned on TikTok as soon as I saw the cover I was like "Ooh, I'm liking this cover I definitely want to put this on my wish list it is time for Christian patriarchy to end agreed um to oh this doesn't really have a lot of stuff on the back I didn't realize that uh historian Beth Allison Barr shows that biblical womanhood isn't biblical but arose from a series of clearly definable historical moments she presents a better way forward for a contemporary church 
Uh, some of the quotes that were given was bars careful historical examples drawn especially from medieval history hold together a brilliant thunderous narrative that untells the complementarian narrative i could not put this book down it's time no it's way past time that we take a critical look at how complementarians is am I, am I saying that right complementarians have been leaving women leaders and teachers out of church history books and expose the movement of biblical womanhood for what it is. Read this book and be challenged and encouraged. Um, <laughs> this book has the power to help Christians build a faith where there is neither male nor female to liberate women from patriarchal hierarchies and to heal the pain inflicted by countless churches. I've waited my entire life, adult life, for a book like this. Mm, cool. That was by Jonathan Marriott. Learning to speak God from scratch. Doo, 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 doo. So yeah, this was recommended along with Church too. I think there were a few other books, but I cannot remember. Um, I can't remember what the other ones were, but I'm pretty sure I put them on my Amazon wish list. So yes, can you see all these books? I don't even know because I don't know how the damn thing is set up. But if you can see this, here is the pile of books. If you can't, actually you can uh, yeah, so those are all the books I've gotten recently. Uh, I know it's a lot. What is that, three? Three, six, nine, twelve, so 15 bucks. Ay, ay, ay. I didn't need them, but I wanted them. Anyway, so that's my haul. What did you think? We've got a lot of nonfiction, but y'all know I love a nonfiction book. Um, the stack is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why the bookcase that you can't see to the side of me has been acquired. I'm trying to put to good use because I'm running out of places to put books. And even though I don't really care about pushing, like putting books in front of other books, it's not my favorite. So we're going to switch it up. We're going to make sure that these get, you know, properly put away. So yes. Thank you for watching my little haul video. Are any of these books sound, you know, appealing to you? If so, let me know in the comments. Once again, thank you so much for being subscribed to me. I really appreciate it. And if you like the video, please like the video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, and if you like, like it, follow me, subscribe to me, please, or hit the notification bell. You know, I'm trying to do new stuff. <laughs> trying to not just do hauls, wrap ups and TBRs. I'm, I'm doing things. I'm doing things. I'm doing a vlog right now. So mm, yay. So thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Ah, goodbye. <laughs>